My name is Sam Fenler, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups at the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host Is Crypto Legislation Coming? Our program will begin with opening remarks from Congressman French Hill, who represents Arkansas's 2nd Congressional District and serves as chairman of the newly formed Digital Assets, Financial Technology, and Inclusion Subcommittee of the House Committee on Financial Services. Following the Congressman's remarks, we have an excellent panel discussion lined up featuring Alexandra Harrison Geyser, Patrick McCarty, Dina Ellis Roshkind, and Patrick Doherty. After our panelists deliver their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that, as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federalist Society. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Mr. J.C. Boggs. J.C. Boggs is a partner in King & Spaulding's Washington office, where he leads the firm's fintech, blockchain, and cryptocurrency practice. As former counsel to the Senate Banking Committee, J.C. represents financial services and technology companies before Congress and the executive branch, and regularly interfaces with financial regulators on a wide array of policy and institution-specific issues relating to financial technology and innovation. JC, thank you very much for joining us today, sir, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Sam. Well, on behalf of the Federal Society, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Congressman French Hill to our webinar this afternoon entitled, Is Crypto Legislation Coming? So I think, as most of you know, Congressman Hill serves as vice chairman of the House Financial Services Committee and as chairman of the new subcommittee that Sam just mentioned, tasked with overseeing all areas related to digital assets and financial technology. Additionally, he's a member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I will add that Congressman Hill knows of what he speaks prior to his congressional service. He uh, was founder and chairman and CEO of Delta Trust and Banking Corporation in Arkansas. He also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Corporate Finance under the George H.W. Bush administration and was appointed to be Executive Secretary to the President's uh, Economic Policy Council. In my experience, Congressman Hill is one of the smartest and most knowledgeable members in the United States Congress today, particularly as it relates to uh, financial services issues and that includes our topic du jour, cryptocurrency. So, Congressman, again, thank you for making the time to be with us today. I think it turned out to be a busier week for a lot of folks than we anticipated uh, a month ago we, we organized this. And uh, we look forward to hearing your observations. So, again, the title today is Crypto Legislation Coming. Well, J.C. Boggs, thank you very much. Appreciate that great introduction and appreciate our long uh, friendship over many years. And Sam, thank you and the Federalist Society, Semper Fi to you for helping pull together this Zoom presentation. All of us uh, in public service are grateful to the Federalist Society in upholding individual liberty and traditional values and the rule of law when they're uh, under assault every day from one corner of society or, a not and, or another. And so it's really good to be with you. Um, I want to start by saying in this Congress, I'm really delighted to serve in this pioneering role as the new chairman of this uh, Committee on Digital Assets. And while the committee is new, the mission's important and the mission is not necessarily new because, as some of you know who followed this for some time, former Chair uh, Maxine Waters and Ranking Member McHenry have collaborated on FinTech for several years. I was a past chair of the FinTech Task Force in the House Financial Services Committee, as well as uh, chair of the Task Force on Artificial Intelligence. Both of these task forces are really precursors to the work we're doing in this Congress on digital assets, oversight, and legislation. And the Congress uh, also um, uh, was instrumental, I think, in looking at this and raising the hood on the topic of tokenized payments when Chair Waters had a, a series of hearings in and around Facebook's exploration of Libra. Uh, it was a very interesting set of hearings, if, if you recall those, as well as Jay Powell and Steve Mnuchin's reaction 
to Libra at the time. We also held a hearing in the last Congress uh, with uh, the new uh, head of FTX's bankruptcy, uh, John Ray. We heard from uh, some crypto entrepreneurs in the last Congress and how uh, FTX has hurt that ecosystem terribly. So I really believe that as we enter this 118th Congress, we've got a group of members that are uh, more up to speed on the issue of blockchain, distributed ledger technology, digital payments, than certainly anybody else across the Congress. And that's going to be very important because it's a, it's a, it's a complex area. Uh, in the work on this subcommittee, I'll be joined as ranking member by Steve Lynch of Massachusetts. And Steve was my ranking member on the FinTech Task Force uh, a couple of Congresses ago. So we are reprising our roles uh, in this Congress on this important topic. So you asked the operative question at the top of the show here, is crypto legislation coming? And um, while there are no shortage of opinions about crypto, digital payments, central bank digital currencies, you name it. There's a lot of opinions in the House and Senate on this topic. But I believe that uh, the answer to your question is yes, if we develop a culture of cooperation across the Capitol on a bicameral basis, and then if we keep the Biden administration uh, engaged here. I don't know how anybody can make the case that we don't need a clear uh, regulatory framework for digital assets. And uh, if we'd had that, I think many of the challenges that we witnessed last year might not have taken place. And perhaps some of the most recent uh, banking crises that we faced here in the new year uh, could have been headed off uh, because of a clear, capable uh, framework. But when you set the stage in Congress, I'll give you a couple of points. First, some people think um, that we absolutely should not have legislation for crypto. In fact, uh, they think that legitimizes what they believe is essentially a criminal enterprise that should be uh, forced out of business. Uh, they believe that Bitcoin and digital currencies are purely used to evade international economic sanctions, uh, finance crime, uh, finance North Korea's ICBM program. Bottom line is it's a criminal enterprise. It has no redeeming value and it should be put out of business. And that view is loudly expressed in the House and Senate by some. <clears throat> but it's not my view. And I believe that we should have a clear uh, regulatory framework. Um, What's happened in the last few months, though, I don't know how to take it in terms of this coordinated uh, regulation by enforcement mode that we've seen uh, the SEC, uh, the CFTC, the bank regulators and others uh, exercise in the last few weeks. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, what the mission is there. Uh, perhaps they in the Biden administration have adopted the premise that crypto should be put out of business completely, driven out of the banking system, driven out of the securities and commodity sector. Uh, they see no value in uh, financial inclusion or distributed letter, ledger or blockchain technology. That's what one could argue based on what's happened. Others might think that uh, suddenly this flurry of enforcement actions is a CYA. Uh, because nothing happened during 2022 vis-a-vis -vis FTX on the part of regulatory agencies. They moved a lot of cases against people who came to uh, the SEC, for example, to ask permission to do certain things. Uh, and then they've been punished by uh, uh, essentially enforcement actions. But when it came to FTX, we didn't see really any enforcement action until the collapse. Regardless of where you come out on that turn of events, I think we have to look to the legislative branch and leadership in the House to craft a regulatory, I mean, a, a legislative framework around which we can have consensus on regulation of digital assets. And if we do that and we protect 
consumers, investors, foster innovation, we can see the United States <clears throat> take its rightful place as a leader uh, in Web3, distributed ledger and blockchain technology, and an effective way of using digital payments. How people end up tokenizing payments is still an evolutionary topic. It's not a done deal. Nobody's come to the conclusion that it's only going to be one way or the other. And that's why a, um, uh, I think absent clear rules, innovation is stifled and innovation is driven offshore. And many of these key developments will take place outside the U.S. instead of inside the U.S. Now, think about that. Reflect for a minute if we had chosen to take that attitude about the internet in the 1990s. Fortunately, we did not take that approach to the internet in the 1990s and former Congressman and former SEC Chairman Chris Cox helped lead that effort by having a do no harm resolution in the House back in 1996 that while he couldn't explain what the internet might be capable of, he felt like it was an important innovation that Congress should allow to flourish and experiment on and that we would regulate and tax the companies that might use it as opposed to taxing the internet or regulating the internet itself. So he let that technology flow and Congress voted overwhelmingly to, to do that. We're sort of in that instance now about blockchain, Web3, a tokenized payment. And I'd hate to see us go the wrong direction. Now, what if we followed syndicated columnist, economic know-it-all, Paul Krugman? Let's listen to what Paul Krugman told everybody in 1998. He said about the internet, quote, it would become clear that the internet's effect on the economy is no greater than the fax machines, close quote. <laughs> wow. Okay, uh, let's put one down in the loser category for uh, Dr. Krugman. The bottom line is, uh, we don't know what the future of this technology is, but I think we want it in the United States in a regulatory framework that allows people to build their use case, pitch it to you, and if it's no good, if it's 2023's equivalent of 1998's pets.com, so be it but at least it's inside a regulatory framework around which people can make those judgments. So Congress, in my view, has a generational opportunity to ensure the U.S. remains at the forefront of innovation, just like we did 30 years ago, 25 years ago with the Internet. But this means that Congress has hard work of working across the aisle and across the Capitol to build that consensus and not just posturing and sticking our heads in the sand. Incidentally, over the last two Congresses, I've worked on flood insurance. So I know a lot about trying to work across the aisle and across Congress. And I know a lot about people who put their heads in the sand. So, you know, we got to just recognize uh, life for the way it is and not the way we want it to be. But I believe that all the things that have happened in 2022 and now in recent days in 2023 set the stage for trying to build that consensus. Last Congress, then chairwoman Maxine Waters and ranking member McHenry made good progress on payment stablecoin legislation. And I believe it makes sense to pick up where we left off to find come up with a product that can pass out of the committee with bipartisan support that would give definition structure uh, to the idea of a payment stable coin. Stable coins hold promise as a potential cornerstone of a modern payment system because they can serve as the on-ramp and off-ramp for participants in a digital asset uh, ecosystem. So it's a common sense place in my view to start. But people have to have confidence in the ability of the stablecoin issuer to redeem their stable coins, which will only happen across the industry if they're issued successfully under a common legal framework. The Treasury and the Fed last year were very constructive partners in thinking through the issues on a payment stablecoin bill. That being said, payment stablecoins are just one part of a broader digital ecosystem and one I'm hopeful that we can bring customer protections 
that exist in the current financial regulatory framework and establish market structure in a digital assets world. I've always been, I've grown up in uh, the financial business, as JC said, four, de four decades in different kinds of roles uh, in finance, including in payment technology back in the very early 80s. And I'm a big believer in our diverse functional uh, regulatory system, our dual banking system. And so the theme that I've followed all along the way in exploring this new aspect of payments is same risks, same activities, same rules, that theme. So I believe we should adapt our functional framework to be tailored around the specific risks related to digital assets. But it, it can't be done just by waving a wand. I think we're gonna to have to act legislatively. To get there, there are complex questions that have to be uh, answered. How do we define and classify digital assets? How do we create a pathway for comprehensive regulation of entities involved in digital asset related activities, such as trading platforms and the related intermediaries? That's what our committee is committed to doing over the next few weeks is hearing from experts, and charting a course that answers those questions. Let me close by talking about two other items that are top of mind whenever this subject comes up. First is central bank digital currencies. Um, going back to 2018 and 2019, Bill Foster, Democrat, Democrat of Illinois and I, <coughs> wrote the Treasury and the uh, Fed to encourage them to understand what CBDCs might mean to the US, whether we needed one, how they might work, how they would affect monetary policy, how they would affect the fact that the dollar is at the center of the global uh, trading system. And that those letters, that nagging, I think, set up a process where, in fact, uh, the Treasury and the Fed have been looking at uh, these issues and the pros and cons. But I have to get this uh, on the record as I use it every opportunity. The Constitution is clear that Congress has the authority to coin money, whereas the Federal Reserve Banks simply are the fiscal agents of the Treasury. So, uh, and I, I know Chairman Powell uh, generally agrees with that statement, but he muddied the waters last week in his testimony. So I wanna be clear again, I think only Congress has the statutory authority to consider creating a new form of money, a central bank digital currency, asking the treasury to uh, issue it and the treasury asking its agent, the Fed, to distribute it. No matter what your personal views are about a digital dollar or whether the United States should even adopt one, there's no question in my view that Congress has the sole authority to make that decision. The Federal Reserve has no more power to issue a CBDC unilaterally then the Department of Education can forgive student loan debt. And I think the federal courts will uh, hopefully prove me right on that assertion. Last week, I mentioned uh, Chair Powell noted that maybe the Fed could issue a CBDC on a wholesale basis. So uh, I'm not sure what he meant by that. I've never heard him say that before. So we've got our lawyers researching as to why he might uh, have asserted that as a, oh, by the way, comment in his testimony last week. Make no mistake, the absolute power of the government means that a digital dollar could be used to encroach on freedoms and civil liberties of our citizens. And that's why we have to be extraordinarily careful about the concept, about the idea, how it might be used, issued, or operated because we don't want uh, such an idea to turn into another government uh, way to gather data on American citizens and craft some new perverted surveillance state. We already have enough of that in our society today. Um, as a, as a, you know, uh, I'll make one other comment about that, and that's just the issue of, look, uh, we asked him to study this CBDC idea, um, and the same would be true on a dollar-based stable coin, about what role those might play in the monetary policy transmission process and in the primacy 
or supremacy of the dollar uh, in the global trading market. Last point I want to make is uh, touch on Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank as, as a wake-up call to the banking sector. The House Financial Services Committee will be conducting oversight to investigate the collapse of these banks and analyze both the management and supervisory failures that led to this week's financial uh, debacle. Yes, Signature, and to a much larger extent, Silvergate, did touch the digital assets business. But the main reasons that we saw these banks recently fail was not because of any crypto activity, but because of poorly managed interest rate risk following a period of extraordinarily over-accommodative easy money in this country that when interest rates were raised steeply to fight inflation, uh, uncovered some bad business strategies out there. Or as Warren Buffett puts it, when the tide goes out, we'll see who's got a bathing suit on. Likewise, the FDIC and federal and state regulators, in my view, failed in their responsibilities in 2021 and 2022 to demand their supervised banks properly insulate themselves from a rapidly rising rate environment. Private sector depositors were incredibly lax in their responsibility by concentrating deposits uh, in, an, in an uninsured manner in a handful of financial institutions. And at the end of the day, of the three banks that went under this week, one of the most squarely focused on crypto, Silvergate, didn't fall under government control via FDI's receivership and instead chose to voluntarily wind down its affairs and liquidate. With that said, uh, let me uh, close by thanking again the Federalist Society for this outstanding forum. This panel is skilled and deliberate and a great group to carry on uh, discussing some of the points that I've outlined in my opening remarks. But I'll just simply say, as the uh, chairman of the pioneering Digital Asset Subcommittee, I hope the answer to the question of this, pan of this uh, conference today is yes, that we work together to find a bicameral, bipartisan framework that will allow America to innovate while keeping investors and consumers safe. So JC, thanks for the invite. Glad to be with you. Congressman, thank you very much. And uh, I don't know how you look on my, over my shoulder from Little Rock, Arkansas, because uh, I had written four questions down and you just methodically went through those and answered the questions I had. That's, that's incredible. Uh, so a, a really a comprehensive view. I'm on the uh, intelligence committee. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> so the uh, that was a comprehensive view and sort of prognosis. We're all going to be watching this uh, eagerly as it unfolds. I think it is too early to really predict what's going to happen. You've got, you're going to have a number of bills in the House and Senate. And, and uh, I know a lot of us who spend time on the Hill, that when you have multiple jurisdictions, uh, you know, many committees looking at the same bill, particularly a comprehensive bill, it's just hard to get done. Uh, so well, let me, let know. me, uh, let me pick up on that and just make one note that I didn't uh, reference in my prepared remarks, which is that we've had a very cooperative uh relationship, as I said, last Congress with Treasury and with House uh, Democrats. But we've also worked real hard in the early days of this 118th Congress with our friends of the House Agriculture Committee. And we're committed to work side by side in through these issues uh, over with House Ag in addition to our friends at Financial Service. That's terrific. So on that note, and you also hit the time just perfect. You're, I guess you're a good House member. Maybe the Senate, you're going to be too constrained. Uh, I wouldn't want to talk further. But uh, Congress, really appreciate uh, uh, your, your time today and insights. It's been great. Look forward to seeing you back in Washington before too long. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to stay with us as long as you like. Listen in. But I know you have other things to do. So we'll, we'll continue with our our panel. Uh, but again, thank you. Uh, we're grateful for your time today uh, and even more grateful for your service to the country uh, on so many economic and national security issues. So thank you. We also have a uh, outstanding uh, panel of experts today, as we did exactly a month ago with Senator Lummis. Uh, we had panelists to talk about cryptocurrency in the wake of FTX. A lot has happened since then. And we're going to begin with my friend, Pat McCarty. Uh, Pat is the founder and president of McCarty Financial. Uh, it's a boutique financial services consulting firm. 
Pat served as counsel to the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee during consideration of Dodd-Frank and was I think, general counsel of the CFTC at one point as well. Additionally, uh, Pat teaches digital assets and fintech courses at both Georgetown and Catholic University Law Schools. So Pat, uh, why don't you take, uh, take us, uh, give us a framework of where digital asset legislation is at. Well, thank you very much, JC, for that intro. And um, let me tell you that it was great to hear what Chairman Hill had to say. I thought he, you know, set the scene. I was very happy to hear what he had to say. Um, you know, with Silvergate, Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank all be getting closed this last week, um, you know, people might want to throw the uh, baby out with the bathwater, and I, I'm totally against that. I think that the digital asset and blockchain um, tech markets hold great promise for the United States. I think that the industry and the technology could lead to some really good paying high tech jobs here in the United States. And I agree, agree completely with where he is on, we should try to basically move forward with comprehensive legislation. Um, Congress does need to act. Um, this is one of those things where when you look at the size of the industry, you know, digital asset market cap is a trillion dollars. It was a three trillion dollars two years ago, but it, still a trillion dollars is a lot of money. There are twenty two thousand nine hundred separate digital asset tokens out there, eleven million NFTs, and more importantly, fifty million Americans own digital assets, and a lot of those people are retail investors. So it's time. My big fear was that. It, that Congress wouldn't legislate broadly. And that's the reason why I was so happy to hear what um, Congressman Hill had to say. I didn't want to see just a, a stable coin bill. I think uh, the SEC, the state securities regulators, the banking regulators will kill the digital asset industry here in the United States if there's no legislation. So I think there are several things that people need to be thinking about here. And one of them would be that we got to recognize that not all financial products and investments are securities. You know, fiat currencies, oil, silver, natural gas, art, wine, baseball cards are not securities. And I think that uh, listening to the SEC talk about that uh, is is kind of like, what do you? This is not the approach. Second, listing of digital assets on exchanges does not turn that product into a security under the Howey test. There's really no expectation of profit by just placing something on an exchange. In fact, as we have all noticed, stocks do tend to go down every once in a while. Third, SEC leadership explicitly said that Bitcoin and Ether were not securities in June of 2018. That's about five years ago. It's not time for Mr. Gensler to go ahead and try to say, well, you know, we're going to redo that issue as well as, I guess, the New York State Attorney General. Fourth, I would note that the CFTC has identified Bitcoin, Ether, and Tether as commodities under their jurisdiction. And there have been trillions of dollars in Bitcoin futures traded since December of 2017, and hundreds of billions of dollars in Ether futures traded since early 2021. No issues there, no problems. Seems to me that there are certain ways to do this and we ought to bring it into the regulated environment. The bottom line is that Bitcoin, Ether, and Tether, top three digital assets by market cap and average daily trading volume, and that's about 75% of the market cap and trading volume, are commodities. So I'm glad to hear that the Senate, that the, that Congressman Hill said that they're talking with the House Ag Committee because those are under the CFTC's jurisdiction. Now let's talk about what comprehensive legislation ought to look like. I think that you're going to have to basically come up with clear definitions and clear jurisdictional lines so that both digital asset market participants as well as the regulators are going to know whose rules have to be followed for which digital assets. Now, there are 10 big items, and I'm not going to go over all 10, but I think there's a couple of things that people need to think about if you're going to put together a bill that's going to actually do the job that it needs to be done. First, you're going to have to give spot digital asset commodity authority to the CFTC. 
so they can handle this. The SEC has sort of indicated that they would love to have it, but I think the thing is, is that following the, the distinction between the SEC regulates securities and the CFTC is regulating uh, commodity derivatives, it's probably appropriate to give this to the CFTC. Second, we need to define digital assets. Now, my point of view on this is that I don't agree with Gary Gensler that all digital assets other than Bitcoin are to be considered to be securities. I think we need to actually come up with three different buckets, digital asset securities, digital asset commodities, and digital asset collectibles. NFTs and gamer items are going to be more like art, wine, and baseball cards than they are securities or commodities. So we need to basically put those into particular things. With respect to digital asset securities and the definition, we're going to not use the investment contract Howey test. We'll come up with a different definition. I helped craft one that was in the buyer bill that was introduced last Congress. We'll talk about that at some other point in the future. I think it's important for us to basically say that all digital assets fall into one of those three buckets. If we do that, then in fact, people will know which area they fall into. Further, to provide legal certainty on digital assets, we're gonna to have to have a joint SEC CFTC rulemaking on the top 25 digital assets by market cap and by ADV. This would be similar to what occurred after Dodd-Frank Act with respect to swaps and security-based swaps. It would cover 90% of the market cap and over 90% of the average daily trading volume. Market participants will know or have a very good lead on exactly where their particular digital asset falls, whether it's a digital asset security or a digital asset commodity. I would also say that uh, it's important to basically give these innovators in the digital asset security space a little bit of a break. And that's the reason why there's a delayed registration requirement under 12G, which is common for new, new companies. I think that's a good idea. I also think that there should be an explicit desecurization process in the 34 Act, very similar to the deregistration process, that would let a security, which is morphed into a commodity like Ether did, convert from being under the SEC to going over to the CFTC. Second big issue for me is basically state versus federal regulation. Digital assets by their very nature are national or international in scope. They are not restricted to being traded in one state or another. For that reason, I think federal regulation makes all the sense in the world. Under my proposal, or at least the way I would approach it, there would be no state regulation. There would be no New York bit license. There would no be no state MSB registration. Now this may not sit well with several people in the states, but the point would be is that these products and services are intended to be you know, interstate and international, not intended to be in the states. Um, I also think that digital asset trading platforms need to basically be registered and regulated as exchanges, not as MSBs. But frankly, this is kind of one of the things where you have to have a duck test. You know, if it looks like an exchange, quacks like an exchange, walks like an exchange, then regulate it as an exchange. Coinbase is an exchange. They have 100 million customers. People trade all day long. That's not a way to go. So I've, I want to tell you, I've got other things that I'd like to talk about, but I know my other panel participants want to get to it. So we'll talk to you later during the Q&A or the rebuttals. Thank you, sir. Pat, thank you. And we'll come back to you for sure. Uh, so Alexandra Harrison Geyser, you're up next. Uh, Alexandra is a director of regulatory affairs at River Financial. Uh, there she works on new product strategy and interfaces with industry regulators. Before joining River Financial, Alexandra served in the U.S. Department of Treasury, where she was the young, youngest executive secretary in the agency's history. So, Alexandra, I, you know, I'd be interested to hear you're the director of regulatory affairs at River. Uh, hear your perspective and what, you know, what industry is thinking around this issue. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, to start out, I'll note that my views are solely my own. Uh, and this is, of course, in no way legal or financial advice. 
Uh, I will also note some limitations in speaking on behalf of industry. Uh, River Financial is Bitcoin only. We offer brokerage, uh, mining, and lightning. And so there are many things the industry writ large might be thinking, uh, and I may or may not be able to tell you what those are. Um, I'd also, of course, like to thank Chairman Hill for his excellent and really insightful remarks, um, as well as Patrick and his insight on some things to keep in mind for regulation. I think, um, you know, I, I play the part of dumb lawyer at a company full of really brilliant tech engineers. And I think it's absolutely critical that the technology be able to continue to develop and that it be incentivized to develop here in the U.S. That is good news, not just for Americans, but I think for everyone. Uh, and the same risks, same activities, same rules is, of course, a good rule of thumb, even if you are a digitally native. Um, so I'd like to focus overall on three big points today. So first is the rule of law versus the rule of mood. Uh, second is the sometimes unintended consequences of common sense rules, particularly at the state level. And then finally, I will offer you 10 rapid fire suggestions uh, for cryptocurrency legislation that Representative Hill has promised us may be coming. Um, first, I'd also like to just clarify terms. I think cryptocurrency is a nonsense term. It encompasses a ton of different technology and different coins. Uh, it all, the industry can cover a lot of different types of activity, as well as different types of financial products and vehicles. You may or may not like the status quo of how we regulate any of that in the US. Um, it certainly isn't regulated holistically. And I am of the mindset that for better or worse, uh, being born on the internet isn't a sufficient unifying theme uh, to lump all of these things in the same category. Nevertheless, I think we all have a pretty good working understanding of what is in the huge cloud word cryptocurrency. So I'll use that term to, per to refer pretty broadly to Bitcoin, Ethereum, altcoins, stablecoins, CBDCs, uh, and the companies that work with those. I'd also note to the crypto crypto skeptics out there, um, the rate of illicit activity by any and all cryptocurrencies uh, is falling and continues to fall. There was a slight uptick uh, last year, bringing it to a whopping half of a percent of all transactions being used for any kind of illicit activity. So if you hate crime, uh, that's good news. So do we. Um, so in terms of the three big points, first, uh, the rule of mood. I am tempted to read Representative Emmer's excellent letter to the FDIC today to make this point. Um, but I will let you all look that up. Uh, this is the idea of Operation Choke Point 2.0, uh, in which the U.S. financial regulators, the Fed, the FDC, FDIC and the OCC, um, as well as to some extent the SEC and CFTC, uh, have spent most of Q1 saying, gee whiz, that cryptocurrency. I mean, I guess you could touch it if you really wanted to, but hmm, seems risky. That uh, the industry listens. Banks listen. Uh, banks are extremely regulated enterprises. They can't afford a misstep with government. Unfortunately, I, that started at Silvergate and then it was SVB and then it was signature banks shut down by New York state regulators uh, for reasons that are still somewhat unclear. It is possible that these events are all unrelated, uh, but I think it is possible that these events are part of a, a mood setting. And I would note it's, it's a bad way to run any kind of industry and certainly an economy uh, by mood instead of by law. So my first note would be more of what we've seen from Representative Emmer, a uh, stop rule by mood. Instead, look to rule of law. Uh, and when you do so, be aware that regulated industries serve regulated industries. And so raising requirements can sometimes create a supply and demand crunch, um, even for companies that are trying really hard to comply. Um, I will note, of course, with FTX, uh, fraud is always and has everywhere been illegal. Uh, then the market corrected it. We hate to see people lose money, but FTX is no longer with us. Many crypto companies are. Those crypto companies, uh, if you can survive a bear market, you are largely working to be compliant. So 
especially at the state level, we're seeing a lot of um, banking and financial institutions regulators focusing more and more on, I'd say, three areas where there is just a supply and demand mismatch right now. So the first is audited financial statements. Uh, all auditors are aware there is a crunch between whenever your financial year ends and when those audited statements are due. But crypto companies are a little hard to audit. Our Commodities trade 24-7. It can be hard to price those fairly and accurately. So an extended runway does not give us time to cook the books. Instead, an extended runway can give us time to make sure that we're providing accurate and helpful information to our regulators and to the public. Number two is surety bonds. That's the insurance mechanism for most of the industry. Uh, it works similar to banking. So you're seeing some companies exit the space uh, for fear of too much instability. That leaves fewer providers offering the same services, which can raise rates and ultimately result in more concentrated risk in a handful of companies. And then, of course, banking, where there used to be three pretty good options if you were a crypto company, uh, and all three of those are pretty much off the table now. So if you are a young tech CEO like my boss uh, started your own company four years ago, you need to have banking partners. And in fact, we're hearing you need to have multiple banking partners so that you don't have too much risk with any one institution. We want to make that easier, not harder. So 10 rapid fire suggestions for forthcoming legislation. Uh, as previously stated, one, stop the rule by mood. Congress is still the Article I branch, not Treasury, not the Fed, uh, not any of the other financial regulators. Uh, two, I think uh, Chairman Hill's two notes were really helpful um, on defining and classifying assets. I would look to two different axes, one, centralization, and two, use case. Not everything wants to be a currency, and not everything acts like a currency. Um, three, in looking at activities and intermediaries, this is a place where the technology really matters. So miners are not issuing coins. Uh, they're not money transmitters. Brokerage and exchanges really are. Miners are much more on the tech side. They don't know who their end clients are. Um, four, distinguish between people who buy cryptocurrency as an investment and those who spend it. I'm not taxed at a capital gains rate when I use my airline miles or credit card points. Why am I when I use Bitcoin? Uh, five, one-to-one -one reserves for crypto assets are a good idea if that's what clients expect. Uh, there should be a way to offer yield, um, probably without making it a security. But if a client wants custody, it should be custodied. Uh, six, don't treat clients as unsecured creditors. Seven, be very clear about what the permissible investments are for client cash that's stored on the platform. Eight, a closed loop for cash on the platform is not money transmission. Uh, nine, permit Bitcoin in 401ks, RIAs, and other retirement accounts. Uh, it's one of very few ways to invest without touching the CCP. And 10, don't issue a CBDC. Only Congress could, but they shouldn't. Alexander, that, that was perfect. Uh, I guess Alexander's 10, 10 commandments. So uh, we're gonna uh, move on to uh, next to Dina Ellis uh, Roshkind, uh, who's counsel in government affairs, uh, of government affairs and strategy at Paul Hastings in Washington. She's a member of the firm's FinTech practice and represents clients before Congress and regulatory agencies. Before joining Paul Hastings, Dina worked on Capitol Hill for the House Financial Services Committee and Senate Banking Committee, most recently for Senator Toomey, I believe. Uh, Dean, I've known you a long time. You're a veteran of Capitol Hill. Uh, what do you think? Do we need uh, federal legislation pertaining to digital assets? And if so, what should it look like and how do we get there? So I, I want to give you my I'm going to give you my prognostic, um, uh, my predictions, which are not clear. Um, um, first, let me say, I go back to Graham Lynch Um, but I worked on things like eSign and Check21 when we were moving to the internet, uh, which is a sort of a similar kind of thing that, that's happening now, a tech, you know, evolution or revolution. And um, um, more recently, when I was with Pat Toomey, 
Uh, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act, which made it easier for companies to raise capital in the private markets uh, and public markets. And uh, I, my first client at my firm was in crypto, and they actually became a registered ATS and broker dealer um, that could uh, trade digital assets as securities. And uh, they wanted to tokenize things like, uh, like we just talked about, wine, um, art, real estate. Um, I was the bank um, dynamic. When Silvergate failed, I was in shock because it is regulated by the Federal Reserve and um, also the California Department of Banking. And what I see, you'll listen to me, is I have a fear of a Fed power grab, Federal Reserve power grab. So I am very passionate about financial services policy. My father was a bank examiner for 36 years. I think I inherited from him. So let me talk about blockchain first. The reason people feel so strongly about blockchain is of um, because um, if there are uses in financial services, meaning I believe it'll be the underpinnings of our entire system, but just as importantly, it um, is about um, um, non-financial services things as well. So um, for instance, uh, uh, tracing food, if there's some kind of a coli, coli breakup, uh, or uh, I know someone who's recording the history of genocide uh, in a distributed ledger. What, the reason that it's hard to, it's been hard for everyone to connect together in their mindset is blockchain means different things to different people. So when you hear, for instance, that, you know, uh, various established companies are going to run on top of blockchain, I mean, I think that's overall positive, but purists in the blockchain world believe that it should be decentralized. And when I say that, it's a movement. Um, it's a movement that's anti-establishment, anti-tech, and, um, and, um, anti-tech and anti-financial services. And they are, uh, when you put together a bunch of technologists in a DAO, um, they feel like they are improving the internet um, and providing value. However, um, on the, there have been fraudsters, but however, there's been a lack of thought about the end user when it comes to, or the investor or customer when it comes to crypto. So, it started out as a uh, securities versus commodity issue um, and ICOs, you know, we could it would have been nice if we, you know, change the regulations of the SEC or laws in, um, in Congress um, for things to be uh, um, to first be a an offering um, with a promise of a future good or sale uh, or sorry, future good or service. Um, and I don't think we would be quite where we are today if we would have worked with then Chairman Clayton um, in terms of uh, making changes to things like accredited investor or Reg A plus. So currently we have uh, we have crypto products that cover the fin entire financial services ecosystem, securities, derivatives, banking, insurance, and you know sometimes these things are in one vertical. Um, and so how to move forward and, and clean up, to clean that up is, is complicated. Um, I know everyone is scared of Chairman Gensler. I've known him since almost the beginning of my career when I was working on eSign. He is um, very um, blunt like me, maybe, but, he, um, but I can tell you um, the Federal Reserve is a much scarier place than the SEC and Gensler will not be at the SEC forever. So my take um, in the current dynamic is that um, now we have this bank element, which could, just, if it spirals, then we could have a Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, Dodd-Frank on steroids type of overreaction. Um, but when it comes to crypto, I believe that the Financial Stability Oversight Council and Financial Stability Board have been coordinating and putting the wheels in motion to designate entities or activities such as stable coins 
as systemically important. That would mean that they were regulated by the Federal Reserve with onerous capital requirements and liquidity requirements, which would make a lot of these businesses not, is not be able to survive. So for legislation, I think it's, I think it's going to be difficult to get something done. Um, and I'm afraid if we did with what's going on um, with the banks right now, uh, what it would look like. On stablecoin legislation, um, I just want to hear some thoughts that I'm going to leave you with. Um, when looking at stablecoin legislation, um, you need to make sure that the legislation uh, doesn't have requirements that are more onerous than SIFI designation, which can be undone in another administration and legislation cannot. Um, this would, you know, fail. Uh, this, um, for instance, you don't want it to have higher capital requirements or things like Community Reinvestment Act like types of requirements. Um, you want to, um, you want to um, also make sure that stable coins are able to be regulated in the way that they are used. So if a stable coin wants to act as a, someplace to park your cash to invest in something else, it, it should have the opportunity to become a money market fund or to become um, another securities product. Uh, the SEC invented money market funds in 1971. If it's more like a payment system, the, typically it's regulated by the states um, and FSB, I'm sorry, and FIFIAF. And so I think there should be comparable um, regulation. Lastly, we need to, and I think Congressman Hill hit on this, we need to think about the future. I were, I'm on a bunch of, um, I'm an advisor to a bunch of startups. And, you know, there are the established players who are already doing this. But there are a lot of companies that are now running fiat currency on top of blockchain that can move all over the world that does not necessarily need a stable coin. So I think all, we should um, have all of these options and not stifle innovation, um, especially since there's a lack of competition in the payments world with interchange. I'm almost finished. And central bank digital currency makes absolutely no sense, um, not just because of the surveillance that we all worry about, but because um, the, result, the dollar is the reserve currency because of our government, um, because of our legal system, and um, because of our robust private sector and many of the payments rails that people use all over the world, like Visa, MasterCard, America Express, um, is part of why um, the dollar remains the reserve currency. Um, I, again, I want to close by saying I am a huge believer in blockchain technology. I am a huge believer in bringing people together who are technologists that would not necessarily be inside an established company. And I think this will be the underpinning for our financial services system, as well as other part, almost every other part of the economy. I, I do think it will be a Web3. Great. Thank you, Dina. We're going to come back to you and others for the lightning round and Q&A. Uh, but before that, uh, last but certainly not least, I'm going to turn to Patrick Doherty. Uh, Patrick is a senior partner at Foley & Lardner in Chicago. Uh, there he works uh, on corporate M&A finance and regulatory matters and leads the firm's blockchain task force. He's also an adjunct professor at Cornell Law School, where he teaches in residence each fall term. So, Professor uh, Doherty, uh, actually, I'm going to note, too, I forgot to note this. Today is March 15th, uh, the Ides of March, which is probably forever associated with the assassination of Julius Caesar by the senators hoping to preserve the Roman Republic. So on that note, you know, are we currently witnessing a political or regulatory assassination of cryptocurrency in the United States? Professor Norton. <laughs> JC, thank you. Uh, my wife uh, warned me not to go to the forum today, so I hope it turns out well. But uh, uh, I am in Chicago and looking out the, river, uh, out the window, uh, uh, I want to tell you, Patrick McCarty, the Chicago River is green. So uh, well, we've got that coming on in a couple of days, too. Um, I, 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 uh, I uh, 
I hold several positions, including partnership in a law firm and a teaching post in a prominent law school. So let me say, uh, these comments are mine alone. Uh, I have colleagues who might well uh, disagree with me. I have some who certainly would disagree with me. But uh, uh, I'm part of the Federalist Society, which is a debating society. Uh, so we're going to have at it. Um, I should also mention that I do have uh, a role in Silvergate, and I have views on uh, uh, what's happened with the banks, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Instead, I'm going to address recent SEC activity in the crypto sphere, and we'll make a few suggestions um, for the agency and also in terms of legis legislation. As in the hearings that uh, uh, Chairman uh, Hill conducted last week, my, my comments are, are not a partisan attack on the, on the SEC. I have spent uh, more than 40 years working with the SEC and for a while inside the SEC. I know it well. Um, I was the first lawyer at the SEC to join the Federalist Society, but even within the federal, even within the SEC, I, I promoted the view um, that federal agencies must stay within their legal authority as they pursue their mission. And, and, and what is the SEC's mission? Uh, well, as Patrick McCarty told you, it, it is not to protect the to protect investors, uh, Chair Gensley, even though you say so. Sounds swell, but that's an overstatement of your jurisdiction. You know, my house is an investment, but my house is not a security. So frankly, it's, it's none of your business. Um, uh, with that in mind, uh, the jurisdictional boundaries, I'd, I'd like to suggest a few lines of inquiry for SEC Chair Gensler uh, in near-term appearances that I hope he will make before the House Committee on Financial Services and and this subcommittee on digital, on digital assets. Uh, I'm gonna ask these uh, questions actually as if uh, Chair Gensler were with us today because I hope these questions will be asked. Um, and, and I would begin where Patrick McCarty began regarding the classification of certain important core leading crypto assets as securities or not. Patrick made the points better than I will, so I'm not I'm not going to embellish on this. But I I I would I would I would ask Chair Gensler, uh, you know, as a sworn witness, is Ether a security or not? He always sidesteps that question when he's asked it, you know, out, out away from Capitol Hill. But I think the answer is more pressing now that the uh, New York State Attorney General is asserting in court that Ether is a security. And I think the answer is plainly it's not because the, the Chicago Merck self-certified its, uh, itself as being able uh, to list uh, Bitcoin and Ether futures. The SEC under the protocol had the opportunity to object to that and it did not do so. And under the law, therefore, the issue is foreclosed. It's done. It's not open to debate anymore. And the fact that the administration is turned over doesn't change that legal results. But I would press him on that point. Uh, uh, then turning to sufficient decentralization, uh, 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 Chair Gensler acknowledges that Bitcoin is not a security, but he never never talk, talks about sufficient decentralization. He, he, he's testified under oath that the vast majority of crypto assets are securities. But look, that doesn't tell us about any particular asset. As McCarty points out, there are tens of thousands of crypto assets. The wind might blow along the Chicago lakefront the vast majority of days, but that doesn't mean it's windy in Chicago today. I mean, so I, I would say, Chair Gensler, why don't you have your staff publish a list of crypto assets and protocols that are not securities, so the public and the exchanges will know that the securities laws don't apply to them. And if you won't do that, or if your list is too stingy, then I agree with Mr. McClarty that uh, that the Congress needs to direct the SEC and the CFTC to work together on something like the top 20 or 25 crypto assets, far and away the largest part of the market cap, 
to make those decisions so that we will then have the clarity that is required in order that people can proceed to conduct business lawfully, lawfully confident uh, uh, in their investments. Um, uh, you, you haven't, however, given us that guidance, Chair Gensler. I'm sorry, your lawsuits don't count as guidance. Rather than that, you say, uh, just come in and register, right? And that's, I'm quoting you, come in and register. But only two companies have ever been able to do that. And one of those two deregistered as soon as it possibly could. I, I ask you as well, uh, how is it even possible for a software protocol to register when it is not a legal entity? Uh, what business would be described in its registration statement? I ask this question as a lawyer who prepares registration statements. Who's the issuer? What's the business I'm describing? What financial statements should be included? Who is the management who would prepare an MDNA for a, a crypto asset offering? Clearly, this is an impossible situation that you have created by omission. Uh, instead of saying, come in and register, don't you actually mean something like close up shop and go away? I, I mean, the, I, now I'm going to point out this is significant, I believe. The SEC has the legal power to create new kinds of registration forms for non traditional registrants. And it has done that for asset backed securities. You could do it for crypto too. So why don't you? And, and, and you know, there's no, no need for legislation there. Congress has already given you the power uh, to to create craft rules along these lines and to create new forms. Uh, but if you will not do that, then I believe Congress ought to either direct you to do so or ought to give that power to the CFTC and direct it to do so. Next, a few questions about trading and markets program at the SEC. Uh, and again, this is directed to the chairman. How is it that you can purport to require crypto asset exchanges to register as securities exchanges when your own rules require exchanges to list only registered securities, but your SEC has never registered any crypto asset securities. So you're supposed to register to trade securities that don't exist, apparently. Or, or related to that, how can you require exchanges to register as securities exchanges when your rules require exchange members to be registered broker dealers authorized to trade crypto assets, but you refuse to authorize securities broker dealers to trade crypto assets. Again, it's the null set. I could go on. Your rules impose duties on exchanges relating to record keeping, order book management, trade reporting, linkage to clearing, SRO responsibilities, and on and on. But no interpretation of those rules relating to crypto asset trading uh, exist and there are no models for this would it be not uh, not be more accurate to say that uh, rather than requiring registration of these platforms your position is that crypto exchanges should either shut down or stop serving us customers and again it doesn't need to be that way you could use existing powers under the exchange act to promulgate new rules on every topic that I've mentioned. You could use existing powers, uh, exemptive authority and, uh, and rulemaking authority under the 33 Act to promulgate new forms specifically for crypto asset securities. You've simply decided not to do that. I, I, su I suggest that's what you should be doing. And if you don't do it, Congress should either direct you should, to do it or should instead give this authority to the CFTC where it might more properly lie anyway. Um, I, I could make a few more comments and ask uh, some questions about the SEC's enforcement program as well, but I want to leave plenty of time for questions from the audience, JC. Um, I, I, so I, I, I'll just leave it at that. I, ask these, I would ask these questions of the chairman respectfully, knowing that he's given an oath to uphold the Constitution, and I ask them myself in alignment with the SEC's lawful mission which is protecting securities investors. I respectfully suggest that members of the subcommittee and the full committee um, uh, should ask these sorts of questions and insist on answers as, as part of the accountability of the SEC to the legislative branch. Well, Pat, 
Patrick, thank you so much. Those are great questions. And I do hope that some of those questions, if not all, were picked up by the Senate Banking Committee and House Financial Service Committee to post to the chairman. I think the alternative may be that you need to run for Congress uh, yourself and post those questions directly. But I suspect in Chicagoland area, that might be a bit challenging for you. Oh, indeed. I, uh, <laughs> we have, uh, yeah, that's a different topic. But to but to Patrick uh, McCarney's point, this needs to preempt state legislation as well. There is coursing through state houses today. It started with the New York bit license. There was an effort to do the bit license in New Jersey that failed, and I'm glad it failed. Right now in Illinois, a bill has been introduced that is moving along speedily uh, to adopt the New York bit license. Only worse. And I and other volunteers are trying to work on this, but it's part of the mood that Alexandra talked about that is swept across the nation. Uh, it, it's, I'll attribute it to the progressive left. It's that mood, it's federal and state working in concert to really uh, put the screws to the crypto industry. And, and, and um, uh, the Illinois legislation is a, sledgehammer when what is really needed is a, a certain scalpel in my view so i agree with a ton of what you're saying um i i love your comments um um do i call you professor <laughs> no, um, no 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 i don't call you professor um, no, you can you well you can't but I, okay I have well no my chance. sister and brother-in-law <laughs> went to cornell law school so thank i have you. great well, respect thank you. Thank um you. i i think the issue is that re, um i love dows and I like that some states are legalizing them, but they, we don't have true decentralization yet. We have, there's always a set of developers that are still there who are innovative, right? And the retail investor um, doesn't necessarily know um, that they, what they're buying is building the network. Uh, and, and so I think there's a, I think you need new, new disclosures, um, just like you're saying. Well, if I can elaborate again, I, I, I mean, I, I think but I feel like I'm channeling Patrick McCarty here, but Bitcoin is not like a stable coin, which is not like a um, utility token, which is not like an NFT. There are many different kinds of digital assets, and you really can't treat them all as if they were the same. NFTs, you know, uh, have no payment function. They don't serve as a proxy for fiat or, for that matter, a proxy for Bitcoin or for stablecoins. They're entirely different. They just share I Bitcoin. Agree. You know, I, all right, we, and, so we've and, heard uh, Pat, Pat McCarty's name invoked a couple of times. Yes. Now, so let's go back to the round two, the lightning round. You each get about two minutes uh, to... It doesn't need to be rebuttals, but offer comments or observations. Maybe you didn't get it off for the first time around. And then we'll go to Q&A from the audience. Pat McCarty. Well, thank you, uh, JC. I got two or three items that I wanted to throw out there because I didn't get to them initially. One, um, spot Bitcoin, Ether, ETFs. I think uh, any legislation that is enacted should actually specifically allow them. And direct this, the SEC to permit them to be registered. Secondly, um, staking and lending. I'm really confused, and I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this, because the SEC has a securities lending rule where, in fact, if someone lends a security, they will receive back interest or a fee, and then the security back at the end of a certain time which sounds a lot like the staking programs that you see with certain digital assets, like Bitcoin, Ether, and Tether, which the SEC has said, no, 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 those are unregistered securities. Now, I would think that that's, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how you harmonize those two or rationalize them, but I would think that any legislation should specifically authorize the staking of digital asset securities as well as digital asset commodities. It just seems to make some sense to me because it's it's a lending function and the SEC has it. And if in fact you take Gary Gensler at his word, he says most of these digital assets are securities. So if they really were securities and they were being lent, they should be followed up on 
under the securities lending rules that the SEC has and which they're amending right now. So I don't want to take too much time. I was just going to say, if they're not securities, right, let's say that they're not securities, it, um, you might be having to deal with, um, you might have to deal with the CFPB instead, right? It's still a financial transaction. Um, usually when well, you're using, yeah. Future, so it, you can wind up worse. Yeah, but future swaps and other things, I would think under the CFTC regulation, because it's a commodity that's being lent, it's a little bit like it's a transaction involving a commodity. If you're going to give them ex the authority to regulate the spot digital asset commodity market, then they should be able to actually approve and let that happen. And so, without CFPB yeah. helping them. Or the, the, other. the spot market there. issue is, um, and I'll let you go then, Alexander. The spot market issue is mainly a Bitcoin issue, and the CFTC does ne need to have authority in that space for sure. So, Patrick, I think you have some great points. I would just, I would note, staking and lending are areas where the technology differs, and those distinctions matter. So, Ethereum went through a merge recently, where it moved from a proof of work system of verification to a proof of stake system of verification. So, instead of um, running an open ledger where the computers are essentially finding hashes and then plugging those in like an algebra equation to check and make sure that everything is getting added sequentially. Uh, now Ethereum runs on proof of stake where the uh, largest stakeholders have the largest say over the network and verifying transactions. Um, this is touted by environmentalists as much greener because it uses less electricity. You don't have to run so many computations. The problem is um, it's now ownership based instead of work based. And so it is a lot less decentralized. So I know there were some comments about um, the SEC's views on Ethereum being a security, not being a security. I actually think we might be in a third stage where maybe early, early days ETH maybe would have been a security under the Howey test, and then it was pretty decentralized. I think post-merge ETH is quite a bit less decentralized or more centralized. So that is, but you can lock up your ETH um, for use in controlling, I think, the, the overall supply of it, um, and then also as sort of a voting mechanism in verifying the network. Bitcoin doesn't work like that. So a yield program uh, in Bitcoin really is going to have to lend out your Bitcoin to some other use case. Um, there's a layer two payment solution called the Lightning Network um, that may be able to use liquidity pools as a pretty compelling use case for offering some low yield rates on Bitcoin. But my, from my standpoint, I think Americans are pretty smart, actually, and they they understand fractional reserve banking. Uh, they understand there's a difference between your checking account, your savings account, and a safety deposit box. I think you can understand the distinction between those things online as well. And so, I, you know, my view is the Howey test is very, very broad, uh, for better or worse, but it seems to me like there are some helpful transactional sort of core to finance reasons why you might want to be able to offer a pretty safe lending product that offers pretty low but steady yield to your clients. And uh, it seems like the SEC views that as an absolute non-starter. Great. Dina, we're going to go to you and then Patrick and then take some questions from the audience. Um, are these supposed to be my, my final thoughts? Or, or um, uh, and I'll just give my final thoughts. My final okay. thoughts are that this is um, this and what we're seeing with AI is we are going to see incredible um, innovation, and we need to be careful because the 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 um, the technology is still evolving. Um, it started in financial services, which makes it confusing when you talk about that space. It becomes clearer when you're in a non-financial services space where you're like, oh yeah, that's food, that's the FDA. Oh, that's, it becomes much easier to figure out what you're, what you're regulating. I also think that there is something uh, to decentralize um, or DeFi 
Um, the problem is that so far, you know, you still have, there are fraudsters, but you still have a group of developers, especially with proof of stake, that are running the network. And, and there, so there has to be um, some protections put into place. And maybe someday we will be in a decentralized, we will have decentralized finance. And um, but we're, we, aren't, we aren't there yet in terms of um, machines being run, able to run everything. Thank you. And over to you, Patrick. And you're on mute. Apologies. Uh, Self-regulation uh, is, in my view, an essential part of the mix here. Um, several of the bills that have been dropped um, include uh, self-regulation as one component uh, of the law to come. I endorse that. One of the organizations I participate in is the Global Digital Asset and Cryptocurrency Association. This is an aspiring SRO. There are others. We are producing core principles. They'll be released next week, having developed them over the past several months uh, from a global base of input. They cover topics such as uh, governance and uh, a protection of customer assets and enterprise risk management, stress testing, sound useful? Capital adequacy and liquidity reserves, books and records and, and independent audits. These are topics and principles underneath them, understand, that we think not only should be adopted within the industry by um, uh, public facing centralized businesses that touch, touch customer funds, um, but also should be considered by Congress uh, uh, for inclusion in, in legislation in this area. So I hope the core principles will be read widely and considered in that regard, and that uh, responsible members of the digital assets industry will adopt them. So, Patrick, thank, thank you. Thank you all for just uh, terrific uh, comments and observations and questions. Uh, we have a few questions from from the audience, and I'll start with with one. I think you can all see. Are you concerned that our digital asset framework efforts are lagging behind other jurisdictions, such as the EU and the UAE, their virtual assets regulatory authority, and the BVI, their virtual assets service providers act? Um, Alexander, you want to take that one or pass the pass? Sure. I, you know, we're a we're a U.S. company. We operate in the U.S., and that's on purpose. So I am. Um, you know, I've got 50 states to keep track of, um, so I don't pay a ton of attention to the nuances of what um, other foreign jurisdictions are doing. I think, um, you know, we'll see. Um, we'll see where the innovation goes. To me, the, the question isn't, can you be early um, or is the U.S. falling behind? The question is, can you get it right? Can you strike the right balance that allows and fosters innovation, doesn't raise too many barriers to entry, especially on the tech and engineering side? And then can, can you address it sort of along the way if you realize you need to make adjustments? And so I think, um, you know, it, more clarity on, on the rulemaking side, don't rule by mood, don't rule by enforcement, um, set out the rules, but, but also be thoughtful about what those rules are. You really don't want to limit an industry too soon um, just because it was a threat to traditional finance or banking or, or something else. Gracie, could I address that as well? Please, please do, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, uh, Alexandra's job is very challenging, um, 50 states, uh, but Bitcoin is not a security. Everyone knows that. Or if you're developing a protocol and a token uh, today, you really have to go outside the United States to do that. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. And I, this is one of the things I do in my law practice. And the BVI, of course, is miles ahead of the U.S. Sad to say, even Western Europe is probably ahead of the U.S. right now. It's probably easier to develop a protocol and launch a token from Germany than it is from the United States. That's probably true. I wouldn't have said that a year ago. And of course, Switzerland, uh, Dubai, Dubai could become the 
global um, uh, crypto asset flotation center uh, uh, because of the because of the SEC's aggression in this area, uh, in my view. And that's not good for the United States for all the reasons that the congressman pointed out. That's very bad for the United States. That's why Congress has got to get some control over the agency, in my view. Yeah, got another question coming in. Uh, given the functional similarity uh, between stable coins and money market funds, why shouldn't stable coins and their issues be regulated by the SEC in the same manner that the money market funds are regulated? Can I, talk, can I answer that one? Because I spent a ton of time working on money market funds when I was with Senator Toomey. Sure. Okay, Go so here's my, well, first of all, I like money market funds. Um, and there, um, in fact, that um, those banks that failed, in terms of cash management, they should have been using sweep accounts and money market funds. The Fed, you know, does not like money market funds and says there are runs. But look, we just had runs on a bunch of banks, right? So I think that um, if um, a company wants their product to be regulated like a money market fund, um, you cannot make up your own rules. Um, either you have to go to the, uh, either you have to comply with 2A7 or um, go to the SEC and try to develop a new product, which has been done before. And I know there's fear of the SEC, but um, I, I don't see any reason why something um, that's being used as a way to, for cash management shouldn't be able to become a money market fund or a similar product. And Pat McCarty, you can you, unmute there. We'll hear from you. Pat, we need to unmute, unmute you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so one, stable coins by themselves, unless they're staked, are not providing any yield. And so they fail immediately, prong three of the Howey test. There's no reasonable mm -hmm. expectation of profit. I buy one tether. A week later, I turn the tether in. I get my dollar back. Okay. So there's, it's not a security. Boom. Second, money market funds pay a yield, right? In fact, there's a big difference here because this is more of a, de a deposit liability as opposed to an equity owner in the underlying assets which the money market fund holds. So it's, it's a very, very different element, okay? So it's not a money market fund. It looks kind of like a money market fund because they take the tether, you know, they take the dollar for the tether and they invest it in other collateral that's yielding things. But the people who gave them money don't have a equity interest in the underlying assets that are used by the stable coin issuer and they don't get a yield. So it's not a security. And by the way, remember, money market funds are part of the shadow banking problem from the from the you know, fiscal yes. crisis, credit crisis in two thousand eight. That's what you know. I, that's a Fed. How can, that is how a can Federal Reserve. Say, oh well, let's go more into the into the into the 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 shadow banking world. Then basically, what's going on here? Which I always thought Look was at the first. So the first failure that we're seeing is a bank that's regulated by the Federal Reserve. The shadow banking system consists of anything that is not regulated bank. by the Federal Reserve. That was a California state chartered bank, and the Fed was the primary federal regulator. Exactly. It's my the point. They were the, and it failed. And they were the primary regulator. All right. Before we uh, turn it back to Sam for, for, for closing, we, we'll have to add another 30 minutes on the next uh, the next mm -hmm. webinar here. So I'm just going to pose this question. We don't have to answer it. But does banking have a crypto problem, or does crypto have a <laughs> banking problem? <laughs> Put another way, you, know, you should banks be, including the Federal Reserve Bank, be more concerned about cryptocurrency risk or an interest rate risk. So I don't know if we have a quick answer to that or we can pass it back to Sam to close up. Crypto has a banking problem and that's a problem for the U.S. Yes, I, like I, I agree. You know, a week ago, we had three major banks in the crypto industry. Today, we have none. And... Uh, we do need payment rails in and out of the crypto sphere. Uh, more rails is better than fewer. Stronger rails is better than weaker ones. Um, uh, crypto assets seem to be doing just fine. I don't see any insolvencies being declared by the Ethereum Foundation or by um, the Bitcoin Foundation. So um, um, yeah, cynically, I have to say, 
uh, crypto has a banking problem, but we really need each other. Yeah. So listen, I just want to thank all of you, starting with Congressman Hill for his just terrific uh, comments and observations uh, and uh, the generosity of his time. Uh, Pat McCarty, uh, Dina, Alexandra, Pat Doherty, uh, thank you all. Terrific. And I'm going to hand it back to Sam to close us up. Excellent. Thank you very much, JC. And on behalf of the Federalist Society, I too want to thank Congressman Hill for his insightful remarks. Thank you also to our panelists for your excellent conversation. And JC, thank you for pulling it all together. I also want to thank our audience. We greatly appreciate your participation. And please check out our website, fedsoc.org, or you can follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned.